Everybody and welcome to Comma D. That's C O M M A D. And I'm your host, Mano G. I hope you have been enjoying my interviews so far. And if you haven't seen them, please go to my YouTube page at Mano McCann. That's M A N O M C C A N N. Today I have combined three interviews into one. Reason being, there was some time sensitive information that was shared that has passed already. But nonetheless, we still had a great conversation. I talked to three of Detroit's strongest comics, Detroit Red, Stan Banks Brooks, and of course, Omar Ty. We started out with Stan Banks Brooks, and I had to ask him, how long have you been funny? Because that's his moniker. And this is what he had to say. The Been Funny Saga started about 1983, 82, 83. I used to be a little quiet kid. Everybody used to crack jokes on me. So I was quiet, so my friends was like, man, you better say something back if you want to get their ass together. So I started, it was so funny, I had to be in the mirror and say jokes. Now I was little, I used to say jokes, I'm the youngest of six. I used to say jokes to my brothers and sisters, right? And they would laugh all the time, and I would keep it going, and it was like the younger, the older cast was like, man, you funny as hell. So when I started doing comedy in 2014, all my friends was looking at me like, man, you been funny. What the hell are you waiting right. on? You should have been there. This. So right. that's what been funny come from, man. After letting me in on how long he's been funny as a nine-year-old, he waited until 2014 to get it cracking. And since he'd been funny, I couldn't resist but asking, what took you so long? What? Fear. Uh, what? Fear. Oh, man. When Def Comedy Jam was out, that was, what, 92, 93, stuff around that year? I graduated high school in 92. Okay. So we're talking about all right. AK, Cap King, all that shit. I mean, I can still do it to this day. I can go to all the neighborhoods I go to. As soon as I pull up, everybody ready with their best jokes, and they still get bah, bah, bah. Yeah, they still get shot down. Like and, they, and they love it. They be like, oh, what about him? You know, they yeah. want me to go. But it, it was just fear. You know, I used to say stuff like, hey, man, come on, let's go do this comedy thing. It's like, oh, man. I'm gonna go next week. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm gonna go when I get some boots. I'm gonna, you know, it, 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 whatever. I, yeah, anything. And then it was just like, like people think just because they funny around everybody else, being on stage a whole different animal. That's right. It, 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 they it, not you, your you friends. Yeah, that's that's what you they call it living room comedy. My 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 friend Father used to call me the free comic. Like everybody be, he said you got everybody in the house laughing. You the free comic. Ah, uh-huh, yeah. He's, he's right. Like damn, then I couldn't say nothing about it. But it was right. just, it was the truth. Yeah, you know, you do it naturally, make people laugh, and it's like once you get on stage, it's a whole different animal. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's it's certain. Certain people could take it off stage. Some people are funny on stage. Some people are funny off stage. You know what I'm saying? He conquered those fears and finally grabbed the mic for the first time, like we all have. But he also shared with me the good, the bad, and the ugly about being the new fish in the tank in his very first time. The first place I performed at was at Paradise in Dearborn. Mike Larry had a room there. Shout out to Mike Larry. He That's my man. He's like my mentor in comedy. And I went there and it was uh, about six comics. So I went up, about 12 of my friends came. So the week before I went up, no, the week before I went there, there wasn't really nobody there. It was on a Friday night. It was August 27th. It was 2014, it was a Friday night. Wasn't really nobody there the, the night, the week before. So the next week I said, all right, I'll go up. And what happened, there was a, a girl from high school who had a birthday party. I didn't even know she was gonna be there. Okay. So she had a big group of people. So I went up, I did about, maybe about five to six minutes. Okay. 
And my boys was sitting there. It's like, man, you could tell you was nervous, man. And I was like shaking like a salt shaker. I'm sitting there like. Yeah. And I didn't have no closing joke or nothing. Because nobody told me when you do comedy, you had to have a set. I'm yeah. Every time you went on stage, you had to be funny with something different. So I went up and did that. And Shorty was the host. Shout out to Shorty. Shorty, was, up. Shorty was outside. Like, <laughs> man, come in. You know, he came in. And he like, oh, you just left the stage? I'm like, yeah. So did that. And that was a Friday. And the following Monday, I went to Mandy's. Okay. The world famous urban legend of Mandy's. Yeah, so, everybody then yeah. went up in there. I went to Mandy's and had a ball. I killed, thought I was, you know, I'm thinking I'm a star. The next day, I, the next Thursday, I went up to Day Say, where uh, Jay Bell was hosting. Went up and bombed. Now that Mr. Brooks is a veteran in a comedy game in the city of Detroit, we discussed the very thing that all comics don't like is when other people don't like you. They sure do know how to let you know. Every comic been bombed. I don't care who you are. Some people act like they haven't, but the, the quietness is worse than booing. I'd rather for you to boo and quiet because quiet is an awkward feeling like time just seems like it's going so slow. Right. But somebody like, boo, get up a heckler, at least make the time move a little. Right, and because, give you a chance to even yeah. probably snap back into <laughs> yeah. motion because as you can see, Mr. Brooks is not a small man by any stretch of the imagination, but he also incorporates his weight into his routines. But he also told me he doesn't allow anybody else to bother him about it. I talk about my weight because 99% of this is all true. This is a true story. So, you know, even though sometimes things would hurt your feelings, but you take painful stuff and make it funny. So right. I can talk about myself just like I could talk about anybody else. As long as I don't think it's personal, Right. As long as it's too personal, because I had friends whose mother was on crack and stuff like that, that wasn't jokes because that was pain. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So I wouldn't yeah. say, you know, I would talk about, you know, I'll just go around a bunch of dudes sometimes in my neighborhood and just pull up and I'll be like, man, we all failures. And so we just start, <laughs> <laughs> they all start laughing because, you know, I could talk about myself and they're like, man, I got a lot of nerve to talk about somebody, man. I'm, I'm failing myself. If you would like to follow Mr. Ben Funny, Stan Banks Brooks, or you would like to book him, he can tell you how. Okay, you can follow me. I'm on Instagram. That's on Instagram. I'm Big Bank Stan. You can check me out. I'm gonna do a few little videos on there here and there. I haven't been doing that. And on Facebook, it's Stan Bank Brooks. Um, follow me on there. You can also follow me on Otis. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Ain't nobody come to see you. Otis. <laughs> that's it. I'm on that. That's about it, man. You see yeah. me around, been funny. Man. Yeah, if you find him on Otis, yeah. you're gonna have a blue shirt on with an orange stripe down the side. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Mr. Ben Funny Stan Banks Brooks. We're gonna take a break right now, but when we come back, we'll have parts two and three on comedy right here with you and me, Bane OG. Uh! Am I dreaming? Am I dreaming? Am I dreaming?
my mind can't decide. I can't decide. Next step, I thought I gotta keep moving. Stay in the groove, can't lose my crew. There's nothing to prove. I've been to prove. I used to the gas, now I'm stuck on cruise. Who knew? After all that I've been through, kept my men too. Now I'm fin to start to make a change. But what's so strange? I used to offend. I'm back to defend you, them too. And it's all instrumental. With this pencil, I'll be gentle. Tell the truth, and nothing but the truth. And from my boot, I will not be you. I send you over to the edge, you're still on the ledge, but you're not dead, he still can't hear you, don't jump, use patience, you can't run, just face it, I can see you coming through, doing what you gotta do, I can see you in another location, when I run, I'm racing, when I'm done, vacation, but my run ain't done, till the elevation comes to a cell, it's my occupation, these my dreams I'm chasing, those sweet dreams untasted, I can see it real clear, and the sight right here to appear, is my obligation. Welcome back. This next comic I interviewed has been around the scene for a long time. He's given other people's opportunities, he's also hosted his own room, and he just so happened to be a good friend of mine. I sat down with Detroit Red and he shared with me his first experiences, how long he's been in the game, and what it was like. Well, actually my 23 year anniversary doing stand-up is the 28th years. of this month. I started in October of 1998 at Coco's House of Comedy. Uh -huh. And um, it was kind of funny because I had never been to a live stand-up show. And when I would watch the greats, the Raw, Delirious, Richard Pryor, Red Fox on TV, I always say, I, Never see getting right. up from all them people right. doing that. They got it. But I've just been a silly motherfucker my whole life. So I happened to go to Coco's. My parents, father had just passed a month and a half before. And a family member was like, come on down to this open mic just to get out the house, have a drink. They do like an Apollo style night, just whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was actually Detroit's Foolish. Okay. Who I saw at the time, Coco and Big Daddy Fitz was hosting, yeah. and Foolish had just went, I think, to uh, Comic View, mm -hmm. and uh, he had me dying. But it's some about him made me say, "Man, I think I could do this." Mm -hmm. So I asked my cousin, "How do I, you know, get on the stage?" She's like, you "Go sign up, and they'll tell you, and you go up." So I went the next week. Happened to get fortunate to get on. And at that time, Bill Clinton had just got his dick sucked. Yeah, <laughs> Monica office. Lewinsky. Monica yeah. Lewinsky. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I went up there and talked about until they started flashing. Because you don't know nothing about no light, no shit. Right. You know, you just talk and you doing your thing. And I was up there a good time. People laughed, enjoyed it. And uh, I've been going ever since. That, that I've been bit by the bug. <laughs> wow. After hearing names like Coco, Foolish, and Big Daddy Fitz, rest in peace, that was good company to have around you as a newcomer. Since 1982, Red has been climbing the ranks in the comedy game, and he has reached levels that I only wished I could get to right now. I shared that with him, and I told him about some of my methods of preparation, and he dropped science on me, and he told me, no matter the method, you always have to prepare. You know, everybody got their own methods of preparation okay. to get into that zone to perform, you know. So none of that hurts. Mirror, family members, somebody. Generally, I tell talent when it comes to family and friends, you want to ask the one that don't give a fuck. Right. 
that's going to straight tell you because they funny. love you. Right. That ain't that working. Ain't, that ain't not that you not funny. <laughs> right. But this new piece you just wrote, no, nah, that ain't hidden. Because generally that person knows your potential, doesn't seen you be funny. So they know they can tell you the real, like, yeah, that ain't working now. You might want to rework that. Right, right. They know you funny already. You know what I'm saying? Because now you show your people that I'm going on stage, I'm doing this. They know what you're doing. Um, so that helps. The mirror helps. Constantly rehearse your jokes to yourself. That helps. Me, myself, I tend to lean more towards if it ain't making me laugh, right. then it ain't going to make them laugh. make them laugh. <laughs> so I write more in that sort, and then I run it by you know, my people. You can always surprise practice with people. Oh, yeah. In yeah. conversation. Yeah. Just run the joke as, a, yeah. as part of the conversation. Don't set it up for material. Right. Which that comes into getting your flow and your timing on because you're really just giving your opinion. You're just talking. That's what comedy is. You're talking, giving your opinion. It's about the delivery, style, flow. So all that preparation works. And then what I like to tell me, myself, I like to be able to think for a second mm -hmm. before I go on stage so that I can get in my zone. You know, I don't mind chopping it up, kicking it, whatever, but if I can step to the side for a minute and get in my own head, that helps me really prepare to be on stage. So all those preparation methods can work. Yeah. It's really about repetition, yeah. constantly doing it, constantly. And no joke is ever complete. You can always add to it. Always add to it. You can always build more. A two-minute joke can turn into a 30-minute set on one topic if you steadily evolving it, expanding it, reworking it, pushing it to its very limits. Yeah. So all that preparation, I suggest, is great because it gives you what you need to do. And hey, hit the mic. Proper preparation prevents poor performance every time. And as long as we got those five P's down, we'll be able to conquer any mic. But you can't just get prepared for the mic all the time. Red also says you gotta be ready for the business aspect of it too. There's a lot more than just hitting that stage. You gotta have that work, that paperwork together. There's a lot in this game. You know, the comedy can teach you a lot about the entertainment industry. Yeah. Just dealing in comedy alone. It help you get your business together. It teaches you business. It teaches you how to negotiate, how to socialize, how to go get the deal, how to finish the deal. So it's, it's a lot that's learned on that side to show business itself. It's show and then it's the business. That's so right. I always preach to any talent of any sort, whether it's comedy, singing, rapping, you starting out in the game, don't don't be going so fast that you don't take care of the business in while you're worried about the show. You got to take care of it together. That's right. Because they, they go hand in hand. Hand in hand. hand. <laughs> I'm with Red on that one, my brothers and sisters. And here's a fun fact. Some comics are getting paid on the stage. Some people are not. And when those who are not become those who are, with those five Ps, they'll be able to prepare and be able to receive whatever the comic stage has for them. If you would like to get in contact with Detroit Red, if you want to follow him, or if you just want to go down there and get on the stage where he will give you an opportunity, here's how you can do that. Well, you, uh, if you're on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, you can find me at Comedian Detroit Red. Every Friday and Saturday, uh, you can catch me down at Tony Roney's Comic Vibe hosting if I'm not out of town or booked on another show. You can go to my page, find all the show information for all my shows. And merchandise is, uh, it's on there too, actually. T-shirts, coffee mugs, and uh, I got a lot of other stuff about to come out in 2022. Thank you, Detroit Red, for spending time with me on Comedy. Finally, we move into our last young man who's quite different in a comedy game. In fact, he's quite different in any game. But he doesn't allow those differences to bother him. I sat down with Mr. Omar Ty, and I got right to it. And I asked him, how long you been funny? Who are some of your inspirations? And what was it like for your first time? And this is what he had to say. Well, when I was a little boy in the single, di in the single digit age. About eight. Uh, so oh no, now. oh, this is way <laughs> farther than this. Okay, probably about uh, three or four. Oh Lord. Right around uh, the same age I was diagnosed with a cerebral palsy and uh, 
my uh, late mother, may her soul always rest, uh, and my dad, who is still very much in my life, didn't know uh, what was gonna happen to me in terms of that, but my vocabulary was, shall we say, just fine, because I used to say any and every curse word out my mouth, and right. uh, my cousins, who were in their 20s at the time, uh, thought it was hilarious, and they do little stuff uh, just to rile me up, just to get them to cuss them out, because they think it was funny, right. and uh, I was always a class clown in school, but I didn't know till later on, say about in my teenage years, that I could make a career out of this because I knew what stand up was but didn't really know anything about it. And in the summer of 1999, mm -hmm. uh, before I started my uh, sophomore year of high school, uh, Rush Hour, uh, the first one was on a uh, VHS, and anybody who is my age or it was in their twenties, and all due respect to people who's older at that time, know Chris Tucker was the man in nineteen in yeah in nineteen ninety nine. I mean Rush Hour, he was killing it with that, as well as before that with Money Talks and Friday, the other films that launched him as well. And when I bought the VHS copy of Rush Hour. I was watching that so much and emulating everything he was doing. I was like, I want to be a comedian just off of that. And I always like to say this is a great story to me because if you know anything about the movie Rush Hour, Rush Hour is an action comedy that has nothing to do yeah. with stand up yeah, comedy. Right. And I didn't know that much about Chris Tucker at the time, but I knew he was a comedian, so I was like, I wanna be just like him. So Chris Tucker is the reason why I'm doing stand-up comedy, uh -huh. and I got gangs of comedians uh, that have influenced me. Uh, my Detroit comics, all those uh, who are still doing stand-up and those that are no longer in those that are no longer with us, which one I want to give a shout out to before this interview is over, uh, got so much love for him. But my top three influence are as follows. At number three, Chris Tucker, because he was the ultimate inspiration for me to be a comedian. Number two, the late, great George Carlin, just a brilliant comedian as far as words and vocabulary. Yeah. Couldn't nobody do it better than him. Yeah. And I know this is a cliche uh, for comic to say, depending on how much you study uh, comedy, but if you study comedy, there's no way you could not mention this next brother that I'm about to mention. Number one influence, the late, great Richard Pryor. Oh, absolutely. Okay, because he set it up, not just for uh, us brothers and sisters, but anybody that knows of and can pinpoint stand-up comedy being an art form, he's the grand master of it. He made it where you could talk about any and everything in comedy and make it funny. And it's because of him that I can make jokes about my ailment because, I mean, that man made jokes about having a heart attack, setting himself on fire, smoking had, crack, have, having yeah. what he was called free base at the time, yeah. and having MS. So he proved that you could do anything within comedy. So those are my top three influences, Richard Pryor, George Carlin, and uh, Chris, Chris Tucker. Tucker. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, yeah, that was, and to go back to the original, because there was never a pinpoint I could say when I knew I was funny, but when I think about it now, I just always had an ability to put a smile on people's faces. And once I knew that you could make a living at this, and not only that, that there's an art and a craft to it, uh, just nothing like it. And uh, I've been doing it for 19 years and proud to be part of it. And still going. Yeah. Wow, Richard Pryor, George Carlin, Chris Tucker, he came out the bag with some heavy hitters, but those are some great influences for any comic.
Can you imagine Omai as a baby just sitting there cussing at you for no reason at all? <laughs> I mean, you already got to be strong in comedy just by you being whoever you are right now. But it's, you have to be even stronger to deal with an ailment or something like that, like cerebral palsy. But, but, despite, but despite all of that, Omar still hit me with the golden rule for any and every comic. In the beginning, uh, especially if you start now, hit the stage as often as possible. Should, no, should nothing, okay, uh, even your own fears should stop you from hitting the stage because the better you get, okay, the more you're going to grow as far as being comfortable, finding your voice, and just uh, learning the feel and texture, okay, of a, of a stage. So in the beginning stages, I can't put a specific number of how much you should do this in the beginning, but okay get out and hit as that much step, as you can hit that but how often pocket. do you go out well now being a veteran in the game because like then and now i currently do not drive uh i go wherever it is i'm asked to go i concluded my conversation with mr old my tie and he says in order to get in contact with him just look him up on facebook oh my tie o-m-a-r-t-y-e and thank you for spending time with me right here on Comedy. That's C-O-M-M-A-D. I'll be back next week. I'm going to do it one more time just like this. And then you'll have this brand new set out here with me doing what I need to do. And we'll have some good times, some more good people on here. And like I said, if you haven't seen any of my interviews yet, go to my YouTube page, Maino McCann, M-A-N-O-M-C-C-A-N-N. -N. And that's Facebook, M-A-N-O-M-C-C-A-N-N. -N. Send me a friend request. I'll chop up with you. Maybe you can be sitting across from me. I would like to thank Stan Banks Brooks, Ben Funny. I would like to thank Detroit Red and also Mr. Omar Ty for being my guest right here on Comedy. Of course, I'm going to spell it. That's C-O-M-M-A-D. I love you guys. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you for hanging out with me and my guest right here on Comedy. I've been your host, Main OG. You can catch me on any of my platforms at Maino McCann. That's M-A-N-O-M-C-C-A-N-N. -N. That's YouTube and Facebook. If you would like to be a guest right here and sit down and chop it up with me about anything, just please go to my platforms and leave me a message. I'll be sure to get back with you and have you across from here in no time. Again, thank you and God bless you. Have a great day. So sit back and relax. Thanks for spending time with me. Don't call me who